certainly appreciate everyone uh, here this evening. Of course, we're <coughs> studying the uh, minor prophets, <coughs> minor because of the uh, brevity of the books, not because it's any less important than any other book. As an example, you see here this Bible here. You see how thick it is. That's the Minor Prophets. So you see why they're called minor. But again, it's not uh, the uh, unimportance of any uh, one book or any of the uh, 12 books of the uh, Minor Prophets. When I uh, left so suddenly three weeks ago, I had uh, stopped at the end of chapter four, so we'll start chapter five. Before we do, though, let's uh, have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this time that we can study Thy Word. We're grateful for the lessons that it presents us, and we're grateful for these men who were appointed by Thee so long ago to deliver a message to Thy wayward children. And we understand, Father, that the messages delivered so long ago are just as relevant today to us and even more so because of the moral decline in this country. We pray that they would be sparing to us, that those who are in sin would repent of it, and that this country would be returned to a moral standard that is in accordance with our will. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Is there a light flashing? Anyway, beginning in uh, verse 5, again it says, Hear this word which I take up against you, this lamentation. So he is now delivering lamentations. Lamentations are just uh, the, the lamenting of the uh, condition that he has to address and he says the virgin of Israel has fallen she will rise no more she lies forsaken on her own land there's no one to raise her up it's, when he says the virgin of the land it's not talking about in the conventional sense of uh, uh, one who is a virgin but really that no one has uh, conquered Israel up to this point in time but there is a time and it's coming when Israel will fall, that will be uh, destroyed. And he gives an example or a description of uh, how this will, what this will look like. He says, a city goes out by a thousand, she'll have a hundred left. And that which goes out by a hundred, she'll have ten left in the house. It's going to be a pretty devastating uh, uh, destruction of the people. There's not going to be many people left. In verse 4, uh, thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, Seek me and live. You'll always find in these uh, prophets uh, an, an offer of uh, repentance, an offer of hope. And it's the same in all of them. Seek me and repent. Start living like you know, according to my will, how I would want you to live. And that's how you can be saved from the destruction that's coming to you. He said, seek me and live, but do not seek Bethel. And that's the capital of Samaria, the, uh, Israel. Nor Gilgal, or Beersheba. Gilgal should go into captivity, and Bethel should come to nothing. So don't look at these other allies. Don't go to these other places looking for salvation. It's not going to be there. 
Again, he says, seek the Lord and live. They see break out like a fire in the house of Joseph. Anytime you hear this phrase, fire, you're, you're talking about uh, fire that is a uh, conflagration that is caused by invading armies. And they see break out like, like fire in the house of Joseph and devour it with no one to quench it in Bethel. What was the accusation? Well, you turn justice into wormwood and lay righteousness to rest in the uh, earth. We'll hear uh, more of this type of phraseology later. And these people uh, were turning justice to wormwood. Wormwood is something that's very bitter. It's bitterness. And they didn't want righteousness, so they just you know, laid it down in the ground. And does God have the power to do this? He made the Pleiades and Orion. He turns the shadow of death into mourning. So he can restore them. He can turn the shadow of death into mourning if they'll just repent. But he also makes the day dark as night. He calls for the water of the sea and pours them out on the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. This is talking about his omnipotence. The Lord is his name. He reigns ruin upon the strong. Strength is no defense against God. So that fury comes upon the fortress. No use to hide in the fortress. Fury is still going to come. They hate the one who rebukes in the gate, and they abhor the one who speaks uprightly. Now, judgment was normally handled in the gates of the city or whatever it was. The judges would sit there and they would hear, hear cases, but they were so corrupt that they were taking bribes and, of course, they were using that to build their mansions. But these people that were doing that, they hated the honest judge. That's, essentially, that's what it's saying. They hate the honest judge. And verse 11 says, Therefore, because you tread down the poor and take uh, grain taxes from him, Though you have hewn, uh, built houses of hewn stone, you should not dwell in them. They, they had built very fine houses and homes with the, uh, uh, the bribes and the ill-gotten gains they had made, but they're not going to get to enjoy it. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you should not drink from them. And they also used that ill-gotten gain to uh, uh, plant these uh, vineyards. Verse 12, I know your manifold transgressions and your mighty sins. You afflict the just and take bribes. You divert the poor from the justice at the gate. Again, that's where they, they uh, held court, if you will. Therefore, the prudent keep silent at that time, for it's an evil time. Those that are wise, since the condition of the uh, country is so bad, the wise just said, I'm not going to touch it. In one of the sublime um, sayings or scriptures of the book of um, Amos, and there are a number of them, seek good and not evil that you may live. Again, is giving them the option of how to uh, avoid the destruction to come. So the Lord and God of hosts will be with you as you have spoken. Hate evil, love good. Now, this is kind of a reverse of what was said before. You, we can kind of put them together. Seek good, love good. Do not seek evil, hate evil. So it's not merely enough to seek good. You need to love it. It's not merely enough to not seek evil. You need to hate it. Establish justice in the gate. It may be the Lord will host be gracious to the remnant of uh, Joseph. Now, this wording, it may be, uh, suggests that there's some doubt that there's uh, God is going to visit them with any sort of uh, reprieve from the destruction to fall that uh, is, is uh, been invoked upon them. It may be, may be, it may not be. It may be that the Lord of hosts will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. 
And indeed, there was a remnant that he was gracious to, that they uh, did come back, but not as a nation of Israel. Therefore, the Lord of hosts, the Lord says, there should be wailing in all streets. They shall say in highways, last, last. And they shall call the former to mourning. Uh, the farmers usually are out working their fields. But this is going to be such a devastating event that even the farmers will be called to uh, mourn. And the skillful lamenters, those are the hired uh, mourners, uh, they will be wailing. Even the vineyards, the vineyards are uh, an inanimate object. They'll be wailing. For I will pass through you. Now you remember the, uh, the 10th plague in, in Egypt where the Spirit passed over the Israelites? That's not going to happen this time. He's going to pass through the uh, nation of Israel. I'll pass through you. And that's not going to be good for them. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. For what good is the day of the Lord? And remember, the day of the Lord is always some sort of uh, significant event. And it could be good or it could be bad. And the nation of Israel here, they thought that the day of the Lord was going to be good because, after all, they're God's chosen people and they, they worship all the time. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. For what good is the day of the Lord to you? It would be darkness and not light. So we know what they expected. They expected the day of the Lord to be light. He said it's going to be darkness. He would be as though a man fled from a lion and a bear met, met him. Now Amos would understand that being a shepherd quite well. Or as though he went into the house and leaned his hand on the wall and a big old snake bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light? Is it not very dark with no brightness in it? So that's what the day of the Lord is going to be uh, to these people. It's not what they expected. I hate, I despise your feast days. I do not savor your sacred assemblies. Though you offer me burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them. Now will I regard your fat and peace and offerings and take away from me, take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not hear the melody of your stringed instruments. But let justice roll down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. We hear we talked about that term just a moment ago. These people were uh, outwardly very religious people. If you uh, define religious as engaging in all these uh, sacrifices, assembly, all that sort of stuff, offerings and what have you, it's not that the offerings were not uh, commanded by the old law. They were. But they were just... Uh, um, not that important to them. They, they just went through the motions. And these, you know, I will not hear the melody of your instruments. We're not talking about instruments and using worship, but just they were playing their all sorts of musical instruments in their leisure time. And uh, the Lord's not going to hear that. Justice and righteousness, two sides of the same coin, I would say. You've got to have uh, justice and righteousness. But justice is going to be like water, and the righteousness is going to be the stream. The water flows down into the stream. So right, righteousness has to have justice uh, enveloped in it. It's got to be there. Did you offer me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness 40 years, house of Israel? Uh, it talks about uh, you carried Sikuth, your king, and Cheon, your idols, and starved your gods, which you made for yourselves. Now, when they, during the 40 years, they had been in Egypt for 400 years or thereabouts, and they had learned idolatry from the Egyptians, and they didn't give it up during the uh, 40 year wandering therefore I will send you into cap 
activity beyond Damascus. And that's an indication of who's going to conquer them. It says the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. The God of hosts, host, I host, uh, really think of host as an army, the God of the army, those that are going to destroy them. So in this case, it was the Syrians that were going to destroy them. And God is talking about the God of hosts. He's directing the Assyrian army to destroy Israel. And another one of those uh, sublime uh, verses, Woe to you who are at ease in Zion, in trust in Mount Samaria. As, of course, Zion is Jerusalem. This is the nation of Israel. But uh, I guess emotionally they still thought of uh, Jerusalem as where God resided. They should not have been at ease there because they were engaged in a rebellion to God. Notable persons in the chief nation to whom the house of Israel comes. Go over to Cana or Cala and see and there go to Hamath the Great, go down the Gath of the Philistines. Are you better than these kingdoms? Well, these kingdoms were destroyed. And the uh, obvious answer to the question is no they're not better than these kingdoms but those kingdoms were destroyed so, so why do you think you're any better than they are woe to you who put far off the day of the doom and they did put it off they didn't what they couldn't imagine that they would be uh, destroyed who caused the seed of violence to come near who lie on the beds of ivory, stretch out on your couches, eat lambs from the flock, and calves in the midst of the stall. They were living good life. Who chant to the sound of string instruments and invent for yourselves musical instruments like David. Who drink wine from bowls and anoint themselves the best ointments, but are not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. They didn't care about the poor and those disadvantaged in their nation. They didn't care about that. They just... Uh, plundered them with bribes and other uh, misdeeds. Therefore, they shall now go captive as the first of the captives. And that was uh, typically the case that would happen when a, one nation would conquer another one in that time. They would carry off all the rich people first and princes and what have you. So that was not that unusual, but these people had an inflated idea of their security in doing what they were doing because they had that they were going to be taken away first and he says those who reclined banquets be, shall be removed the Lord God is sworn by himself he can't swear by anybody higher than himself the Lord God of hosts says I abhor the pride of Jacob and hate his palaces and the pride of Jacob had to be their uh, the idea that they were favored of God, that they were God's own chosen people, so they, they couldn't be destroyed. And God had, had hoard that thought. He says, therefore, I will deliver up the city and all that is in it. And it shall come pass if ten men remain in one house, they shall die. Total destruction. And when a kinsman of the dead with one who will turn or burn the bodies, pick up the bodies, take them out of the house, he will say to the one inside, are there any more with you? And the answer is going to be no, if anybody could answer. But it's unusual for uh, Jews to burn bodies. That was not their custom. But the destruction is going to be so bad that there was really the only alternative is to go ahead and burn the bodies, pick them up, take them outside and burn them. It says, hold your tongue for we dare not mention the name of the Lord. It may be that uh, they um, didn't want the uh, recognition. They didn't want to be considered as um, 
or obstructing the justice of God. They didn't want to be recognized as one that was opposing what was happening. Or sometimes, I guess the feeling is better to be quiet than to speak up. It says in verse 11, For behold, the Lord gives a command, He will break the great house into bits and the little house into pieces. It's going to be a pretty devastating uh, event. Do horses run on rocks? Does one plow there with oxen? Uh, oxen? Well, the answer is no. That's crazy. You don't uh, run horses on rocks. You know, they didn't have uh, horseshoes. At least I don't think they had horseshoes. But anyway, they uh, <laughs> they have horseshoes. <laughs> I don't remember. But anyway, you just don't run horses on rocks, and you don't plow rocks either with uh, oxen. That's just uh, crazy. As crazy as it is, this is also crazy. You have turned justice into gall and the fruit of righteousness into uh, uh, wormwood. Again, we have the same that the juxtaposition of justice and righteousness. It occurs again. So they go together. You who rejoice over, over Lord Debar, who say, Have we not taken uh, Carnaim for ourselves by our own strength? They had took great pride in their own strength, but that was not going to save them. And he says here, But behold, I will raise up a nation against you, O house of Israel. And that was, of course, the Syria. Says the Lord God of hosts, host men, armies. And they will afflict you from the entrance of Hamath, to the valley of the Arabah. Uh, I wonder if I'll stop now. What do you think? <laughs> We're down to verse 7, no, chapter 7. Well, I'll tell you what, I'd like to finish this next week, so I'll go on. So now we have the visions. Thus the Lord God showed me, behold, he formed locust swarms at the beginning of the late crop. Indeed, it was the late crop of the king's mowings. And so when it was, when they had finished eating the grass of the land, I, that I said, O oh Lord, forgive, I pray, O oh, that Jacob may stand, for he is small. Lord, relented concerning this, he shall not be, said the Lord. Now, you, we talked about lo locusts when we were uh, talking about Joel, but it was not an unusual thing back in this time for the locusts. But it, the Lord was going to destroy them then with the locusts, but uh, uh, apparently Amos prayed that he wouldn't destroy them, and, and God relented. Then there was the very vision of the uh, fire. The Lord showed me, behold, the Lord said, for conflict by fire, and it consumed the great deep and devoured the territory. And then I said, O oh Lord, again, the same prayer. And then the Lord again relented. But then here was the vision of the plumb line. And you know what a plumb is, plumb bob and all that stuff. Then he showed me, behold, the Lord stood on the wall made with a plumb line with a plumb line in the sand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? He said, a plumb line. And a plumb line, this plumb line may not, it's not a physical plumb line, but it determined how upright the uh, nation of Israel is, how straight they were. Were they plumb up and uh, level? He says, Behold, I'm setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. And this time, he says, I will not pass by them anymore. Remember, in Egypt, he passed over them. But now he's not going to pass by them anymore. The high places of Isaac shall be desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. I will rise with a sword against the house of Jeroboam. So there's no uh, relenting this time. Then Amaziah the priest of Bethel went to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to hear all his words. And we'll have to find out what the response was is uh, next week. So.